ITR Boxing. You heard it here first. Pretty cool videos. And I heard they're also in HD. ITRboxing.com. I'm on with, uh, oh, shit. To me, you're an MMA legend, but I'm not Mr. MMA guy. But you're from the era of MMA when I used to rent the videos and I had a girlfriend and she worked at a video store. So you're from my era of MMA. So we're yeah. on with Nathan Quarry. I don't, I don't know if I feel right calling you Nate because I see that you identify as Nathan Quarry on the internet. So I don't, I don't know you like that. So I'm just going to say Nathan Quarry. We're going to keep it formal, but you're... You're, you're, I go by whatever you want to call me. I, I go by Nate. I go by Nathan. It doesn't matter to me. I'm, I'm cool with whatever. Well, you're a pretty tough dude. So I'm going to just, I'm, <laughs> I'm going to be pretty laid back, but it's pretty cool to talk to you because even though I'm a boxing guy, you are from the era of the UFC. I did watch when it was like just a bunch of tough guys figuring out, like, it felt like you were kind of learning life through fighting. And it, like, I kind really? of, that's what it felt like to me as like yeah. you're just it was like a group of renegades kind of gathering in packs and then like going out into the world to compete that's what it looked like i guess also being old now and then reflecting on it well um, let me let me comment on that because i've got to agree with that 100 percent. i was i was about 24 years old i was at a party and at this time in my life i never even watched boxing i thought it was too violent I was just kind of becoming free from the religious cult that I was raised in. So I, I was not allowed to participate in any sports whatsoever. And this guy comes up to me at a party and he goes, man, there's these two guys beating the hell out of each other in a cage on TV. And my first thought was, who would do that? That is just bizarre. In this day and age, why would you choose to go through something like that? And I go inside and I see Hoyce and Ken fighting it out. And what really got me more than the skill, the athleticism was at the end of the fight, they stood up, they shook hands and they hugged. And that just blew my mind. And I, I realized this isn't the violence I was always told it was, this is sport. And now jumping kind of to what you said, <clears throat> the Ultimate Fighter season one, they couldn't get they couldn't find enough guys to be on the show. Nobody cared. Nobody was really applying. But the 16 of us that were there, and I believe the number is nine of us, eight stayed in the UFC. Bobby Southworth went on to win a title, and I think it was Strike Force. So over half of our group, uh, I fought for the title. Kenny Florian fought for the title at least a couple times. Forrest Griffin won the light heavyweight title. We were legit, I don't want to say contenders, but participants in our sport. And the big reason for that was, was to your point, we were just guys that saw this sport and went, so there's no chance of making any money. There's no fame involved and there's no chicks at the gym. I'm in, let's do this. And if you are willing to go through all of that to fight in a warehouse in front of 50 people for no money, then you really had a love and a passion for it. And then the success, the exposure, everything else just happened to come along. So after season one, season two, you had some of the same kind of guys, but mostly after that, it was, well, I want to be famous too. I want to be a MMA star. I'm going to be a reality TV star and, and be on tough. And then you'd have entire seasons where nobody was good enough to even stay in the UFC. It was, it was all about the passion for fighting for us. I feel like, and um, I'm, I always have to correct myself because I'm insecure about this. I'm not the biggest MMA guy, but I've been around MMA guys my whole life. I'm more of a boxing guy, but it felt like that the, uh, the ultimate fighter was a turning point in my opinion, towards the negative side of what MMA became, where it became more about, like you're saying, celebrity image. There was like this bro mentality kind of, Whereas what I was kind of drawn to was kind of like the, the nuance. It was like a speakeasy fight. It was like, come yeah, here. Yeah. And then like these guys, <laughs> the, and I, I kind of like the specialists, the specialty guys. There's the wrestler guy. There's the real crazy yeah. from another country, kick you in the head guy. And it felt like yeah. you were meeting up on some, a polite gang fight. Yeah. And man, thinking about some of the stuff i remember during 
during the filming of Tough One, Chris Lieben came back and took my spot because I was injured and he was gonna go up against Josh Koscheck. And we knew that Josh didn't like to get hit. He was a wrestler. All he was gonna do was take Lieben down over and over again. And I said to him, it's like, man, so you've never, we've never thought about this, but what if when he takes you down, you just try and stand back up again. You don't try to submit him from underneath because his forward pressure is too much and he's shoving you into the cage. What if you just stood right back up? And it was like, what? Well, no one's ever thought of that. And now you have wall walking, you get taken down, you don't wanna be down, you stand back up. No other sport was in a cage. Uh, no other sport had punches on the ground. No other sport had you trying to stand back up while getting hit. There were so many things that we had to figure out on the fly. And that was what made, made it so exciting for us that, that doing that. I remember the day, so I trained at Team Quest for many years. I'm sparring with Randy Couture, a Greco-Roman world champion. Matt Lemon was there too. He was a silver medalist in Greco-Roman in the Olympics. So I'm sparring with Randy and he starts to pummel and get underhooks. And every time we would pummel, first off, he outweighed me by 20, 30 pounds. Secondly, he'd been wrestling for 30 or 40 years. I've been wrestling for zero years. Every time we would pummel, he'd get the best of me and slam me on my head and then I'd be done. For some reason on that day, I just said, you know what, I'm not gonna pummel with you. And I tucked my elbows in and I threw an uppercut, a hook and a right hand and all three landed. And he kind of stumbled back and I looked at him, I, would get, I just said, I'm never pummeling with you again. Why would I? This is MMA. This isn't wrestling. And that became my thing. And when these wrestlers would take me down, I'd be like, well, I don't need to stay down here. And I'd start using the wall and standing up and guys started to figure it out. And I'd give up the mount up against the wall just so their weight would come off me and I'd pop right back up. It was, it was really such an exciting time to, to be figuring these things out as you were fighting and as you were training. Yeah, true pioneer. I actually wrote in my notes because I actually take notes because I'm that organized and like I have to control nice. my life is um, I'm kind of curious, just like being a guy that's always been in boxing gyms. I love hearing about the gym dynamic. Like what was Tim Quest? Was it like a nice gym? Was it a warehouse? What did it look like? What were the gym dudes? Like, I'm just curious about the experience of what Tim Quest was, because as I'm saying, I'm an outsider. I'm just curious when I hear these stories, I want to get the picture of like what practice even was like. Wow. So it, it really evolved throughout the years. Uh, let me start back at the, the first day I, I went to a gym. So after I saw the UFC when I was 24, I went into the kitchen, I opened up the phone book and I saw a gym that was teaching Jeet Kune Do and Brazilian Jiu Jitsu. And my roommate said, Brazilian Jiu Jitsu, that's the shit that they're using in the UFC. And I went, well, that's the gym I'm going to call. So I called up the gym and it just so happened the coach was there, who I found out later was almost never there. And he convinced me to come down for a week's free trial. So I do an hour and a half of kickboxing. And the training was so bad, it was ridiculous. It was jab, cross, hook, jab, cross, hook. I get what you're saying. Yeah, yeah it, it, was, it was terrible. And then we come to jujitsu. And especially at that gym, the, the head coach, which I can go into later about his lack of coaching ability, he, was, he wanted to be the tough guy in the gym. And I didn't know any better. So it, they would show maybe a technique or two, and then we would just roll. We would just practice jujitsu for an hour. And I got beat up so badly that first day that I was sick for three days afterwards. I just got tapped over and over again and just tortured on the mat. And I hadn't been doing any training. Again, I knew absolutely nothing. But as I walked out the door, I said to myself, I'm going to keep coming back here until I can beat every one of your asses. And that's what I did. Three days after being sick, I came back the next day or Thursday, I think it was, was sick for another three days, signed up and, and just started going. And it was... <clears throat> It was such a difficult time because no holds barred, as it was referred to, was such a fringe sport. There was, I think, five UFC pay-per-views a year. Nobody really knew much about it. I realized, I started, I took my first fight at 26, 
And I realized, okay, if this is something I'm going to start doing, I need to get better at this. So I went to boxing gyms and uh, it's kind of usual. I'd show up and they'd see if I was serious or not and make me just hit the bag for an hour. And I'd come back a few days later and do the same thing and jump rope. And finally, after a few weeks, the coach comes up to me and says, well, it looks like you're pretty serious. You know, you work hard, you're athletic, so we'll get you some mitt work and get you training and we'll line you up some, some fights. And I said, oh, coach, I appreciate it, but I'm actually doing this no holds barred stuff, so I want to use the boxing to make my, my MMA fighting better. And he just looks at me and goes, cool. All right, well, you can go ahead and go then because, yeah, we don't train you people here. That and sounds so, like boxing. Like that really sounds like how, yeah, <laughs> that sounds exactly that just keep going. But I'm like, I can totally see that happening. So it was tough. And I would get training from whoever I could find. Uh, I got introduced to another random boxing coach. And for a few weeks, I would just show up wherever he was. And I'd be like, hey, I'm here. Uh, I've got some minutes for you hold for me. And we'd literally go out in the parking lot and I'd work out there. And then at, at 24 hour fitness one day, I'm there lifting weights and I see this goofy looking guy wearing Muay Thai shorts and Muay Thai shorts are so ostentatious. If you're wearing them, you're either a complete idiot or you're a Muay Thai fighter and you deserve to wear those shorts. So I walked up to him and I said, so what are you doing wearing those shorts? He goes, I'm a, I'm a kickboxing coach. And I said, well, I need a kickboxing coach. Do you want to train me? It's like, I have one rule, never stand me up. I was like, cool. My rule is I always show up. So we're going to work out well. And it was the exact same thing. We started training in his backyard and then in my front yard. And then by this time now I'm, I'm training at team quest and I invited him to come up to team quest because we didn't have a boxing coach or a kickboxing coach. And he ended up working with quest. And now that man, his name is Dave Hagan. He is a judge for the UFC. So all, all just through this connection and sticking with the sport. But now, so getting back to what, what, the, what Team Quest was like. So bef I, I keep jumping all around, but even before Team Quest was Performance Quest. And it was Randy Couture's gym. He bought a weightlifting uh, studio. And that's not how he makes his money. He was making his money fighting. So he wasn't managing it correctly and it ran out of business. And then he had to find someplace else to train. Well, one of his buddies that he used to wrestle with had a car lot. And in the back of the car lot was a big warehouse. And we're talking wooden side, wooden, not a metal, beautiful, nice one, just an old ratty cobwebs everywhere. And we threw down a wrestling mat. And this was the new team quest. And it, it was kind of like that speakeasy thing. You, you went there, if you knew about it, if somebody invited you, if someone brought you along and we would just beat the hell out of each other for these practices over and over again. And as time went on, the facility got nicer and nicer and Team Quest got bigger and bigger <clears throat> as Randy was winning more titles and, and Lumen was successful. And we had guys from all around the world flying in to train with us. You never know who would be there. I show up one day and BJ Penn's there for the week or Rico Rodriguez is there or Chuck Liddell's coach, John Hackelman was there. Just, you never knew who was gonna be there. It was so good to be able to, to train with these guys and get a feel for where you're at. BJ Penn actually called me many years later. He said, I was the club pro at the time. Like the golfer who's not quite good <laughs> enough to go on the tour, but kind of keeps everybody else in line. I was like, BJ, that's one of the nicest things I've ever heard. <laughs> and I was, yeah, and, and at the time, especially with five UFCs a year, there was no way I was going to get on a UFC card. And then the ultimate fighter happened. But the, the mentality of the gym, I don't know how it is in the boxing world as much, but so much for us, it was <clears throat> whoever's the toughest guy, who's ever, whoever is the owner whatever their mentality is, is kind of how the gym goes. And for us, that was Couture. And he'd been wrestling since he was a kid. He understood competition. He had a very good ego that he knew he was the best in the world. He didn't need to prove it by beating up people that were weaker than him, but he could also put it on people that needed it, that had an attitude. 
And so our practices were just, just brutal wars. And as I started kind of educating myself and I ended up leaving Team Quest, so the ultimate fighter happens, Randy Couture ends up moving down to Las Vegas and he is no longer the top dog at the gym. Now that spot is taken up by Matt Lindman. And Lyndon does not quite have that same mentality. And a quick story about that is on a, I think it was a Wednesday or Friday practice, <clears throat> Scotty Smith, who eventually made it into the UFC, shows up and he's got a fight on Saturday at King of the Cage. So it's not a, a big fight, but it's a pro fight. And he would come up just as far with us because we did very little technique and a lot of sparring. And so he would come up and he's sparring and it's the, the last round of the day and everybody else is just sitting around watching Lin Lin and Scotty Smith spar. And Scotty kind of has this way about him where he'll peaks and valleys. So he'd throw a good combination, then he'd get tired and he'd kind of shut down, throw a good combination, get tired, kind of shut down for a few seconds. So he does that and he kind of shuts down and I can see Lin Lin kind of like all right so he kind of loosens up and he's not hitting very hard well scotty gets his win back and boom it's Lindland with a hard shot and matt's head just rocks back and he just goes oh i guess we're on and now it's like two tasmanian devils just beating the hell out of each other from one corner of the the mat to the other well scotty shuts down again because now he's tired he did his 15 20 second burst and you see Lindland just go not today and just starts beating on Scotty. And Scotty realizes, holy shit, I'm in the fight of my life and starts throwing back. And they fight all the way down to the other corner of the mat. And by this time we have, uh, we have padded walls. So Scotty's leaning up against the wall. Matt grabs him behind the head and knees him right in the sternum and just drops him. And you'd think maybe that would be enough, no. Matt now starts yelling and cussing at him about disrespecting him coming into his gym to try and knock him out so as, as Matt saw it anyways. And he soccer kicks him in the ribs twice mm. and then head stomps him at the base of the skull twice. Just boom, boom. And I'm looking at this and my eyes go wide and I go, oh my God, he, he could literally kill him here. Someone needs to stop him. And I look around the room and I'm like, I guess it's me. So I stand up and I'd never seen Matt this enraged before. I don't know if he's going to attack me or what's going on. So I put up both my hands and I walked towards him. I said, hey, man, I think he's good. I, ding, ding. That, that, that's enough. And he starts yelling at me, you saw what he did, blah, blah, blah. And I was like, yeah, man, I, I, I saw everything. Okay, let, let's call it a day. And I go over to Scotty, who's still on all fours, head down on the mat. And he looks up at me with tears coming out of his eyes and blood pouring out of his nose. His nose is broken. And he just looks at me and goes, what did I do? And I just said, yeah, man. Um, yeah, I don't, I don't know what to tell you. So Scotty flew back home, I think, that day. He couldn't fight that weekend, obviously. <clears throat> and then... So Robert Follis at the time was kind of the head coach and the manager of the gym and he hadn't been there. So he asked me what happened and I told it, you know, I try to be very matter of fact. I don't try to go, oh, that guy was an asshole. I'll just say, no, this is exactly what happened. And Robert says, well, what do you think we should do about this? And I'm always real big on, well, what if it was me? What if it was somebody else? Does this guy get special treatment because of who he is? I said, what would you do if it was me? If I lost my shit like that on somebody, he's like, oh yeah, well, we have to deal with that. So a couple of weeks go by and finally everybody's back in town from their travels. It's a team practice. Couture is still there. And we all form a circle in the, the center of the mat. And, and Randy says, uh, you know, there was something that went down here a couple of weeks ago that we feel we, we need to address. Matt, would you like to address the group? So Matt then stands up and starts pacing around the guys who are all seated. So you've got this guy over six foot tall looking down at you. And he just goes, yeah, with what happened here the other day, if that scared you, I'm sorry. Did that scare you? Because if it did, I'm sorry. And then he goes and sits down. <laughs> and Randy just goes, 
I guess that's it. We'll see you tomorrow. <laughs> and I'm sitting there going, worst apology ever. <laughs> Are you kidding me? Uh, and so when Randy ended up leaving the gym and Matt kind of took over, uh, and team practice carried on. Fallis was still the coach at the time, but Matt was now the, the top dog. And I'm not somebody to really complain or talk behind somebody's back. If I have something to say, I'm going to say it right or wrong. As, as it's been told many times about me, you know where you stand with Nate Quarry because he will tell you. And after practice one day, Matt was gone, Robert was gone. All the guys are just kind of hanging out and they're going, man, I, we hate these practices. We never know what we're going to be doing. It's always completely random. We'll do something for 10 minutes. We'll never see it again. And then we spar for 45 minutes and, and maybe we'll do some exercises afterwards. I, I don't know. And so I told the guys, I'm like, I, instead of sitting around here bitching and complaining, why don't we actually tell them what we think and maybe we can make some changes. And so I went and long story short, I met with Robert and Lynn Lind and told them, you know, what everybody in the gym is thinking. I said, you know, I've got guys like Dean Lister in my weight class and our jujitsu coach is just got his purple belt a, a few weeks ago. We don't have a boxing coach. We don't have a kickboxing coach. We don't have a conditioning coach. We don't have any of these things. And this sport is really taking off. We need to grow this. And they just looked at me and said, we're not a gym. We're not a jujitsu gym. We're not a boxing. We're an MMA gym. We're not bringing in any of those coaches. If you don't like it, leave. And so I went back to the team and I said, guys, they're, they're not going to do anything to support us as fighters. We're paying 20% of our wages to them. And all we're doing is showing up and beating the crap out of each other. Instead, why don't we take that 20% and we'll invest in our own coaches. We can go to any gym in the city and say, Hey, we're the team quest, former team quest fight club. We'd like to come here and spar and train and advertise the hell out of your gym that this is where we're at. And we can use that 20% to bring in these, these world-class coaches to make us better fighters. And every single member of the, the fight team said, well, we didn't realize you were really gonna go talk to them. So no, we're gonna stay here. And I went, cool. So I'm out and good luck. And I saw a lot of really good guys, their careers just completely end there. I saw guys move out of the state so they didn't have to have a conversation with the coaches as to why they were no longer happy there at the gym. Uh, yeah, it's the dynamic of the whole gym. It was difficult times. And so much, I, even back in my, the gym that I started at, Straight Blast Gym, the reason why I ended up leaving that gym was that I mentioned the head coach there was an unpleasant person. He wanted to be the, the gym superstar without ever fighting. And, you know, he was good. Six foot eight could be depending on the day, 240, 260, 225. And I ended up fighting a guy by the name of Mike Whitehead here in Portland, an okay. amateur fight. And it was supposed to be a 15 minute first round, which is bad enough. And then That's a five minute, intense. That's pretty five intense. minute overtime. Yeah. And I didn't even know who Mike Whitehead was at the time. He was the third ranked wrestler in his weight division in the nation. And I had no idea. And I had just knocked out one of his training partners a week or two before. So it's a great So match. he knew. He knew about me. I didn't know about him. A referee looks at me and says, are you ready? And I nod my, no, the referee looks at Mike and says, are you ready? And Mike says, yes, and runs across the ring. He looks at me and says, are you ready? And I go, what the hell? And Mike is on me. He's got me in the corner of the ring. This wasn't a cage. Pick me up and slam me down. And this happened several times throughout the fight so it, i would get him in a triangle he would shove me through the ropes and punch me through the ropes and the referee would stop break okay move back to the center uh mike get back down the triangle mike would look at him and go no i'm not going to do that you go get back down in the triangle no and the referee would look at me and go well nate stand back up i should mention that the referee the judges and the timekeeper were all chosen out of the crowd they were people that showed up to watch the fight that were friends with the promoter and he didn't have any of those people. So he's like, Hey, this referee shirt will fit you. How about you wear it? And so we'd get stood back up again and he'd look at Mike and say, are you ready? And Mike would run across the ring and grab me. And 
the timekeeper bumped the clock at the start of the fight. The first round went for 22 minutes. Which and then that's we intense. To, like that is crazy. It was brutal. And it, it's, it was a uh, Chael Sonnen holds fights there now in a cage. It's very well professionally done. But back in my day, I remember I'm getting punched in the face on the mat and there's a woman sitting right next to the ring smoking, pounding on the mat right next to my head going, beat his ass. And this fight was so crazy. So finally we get him to stay in his corner and we meet in the corner. He shoots on me and I finally sprawl. I end up taking his back and I'm hitting him in the ribs literally for five minutes because this is a 22 minute round. He has his hand on the outside of the ring and he's trying to pull himself out of the ring underneath the ropes as his corner is instructing him to do. And the referee is just standing there watching the whole thing. So I sit up, I land a big shot, grab the rope and start pulling him back into the ring so he can't escape. The referee starts yelling at me for holding on to the rope. So I start yelling at the ref like, do your goddamn job. He's trying to escape. I'm here fighting. You do it. And I turn around and I hit Mike and we just keep going at it. Years. So, so the, the, the end of the fight, what I was told by one of the judges was the promoter came up to them and said, okay, how'd you score this fight? Who won? And the judge goes, we don't know what we're doing. We don't know how to, how do you score a war like that? We don't know if it was Mike and the promoter went, Mike, got it went into the ring, announced, Mike Whitehead wins the fight. So this was my first loss, and I was just devastated. Fast forward a few years from there, I'm at some other fights, and I see Mike Whitehead with his whole crew there, and they're kind of pointing at me and laughing. And I walk up to him, and I'm like, guys, all right, what's the joke? And they go, you remember that time Mike was trying to crawl out of the ring, and you hit him, and then you got in an argument with the ref, and you hit him again, you kept on fighting? I'm like, yeah. You knocked him out. He was unconscious. We have it on tape. He was asleep. And then you hit him again, and he woke up, and you kept on fighting. So I have overturned that loss, and I call it a victory for myself. I don't even care if Mike does now or not. He's, he's good people. But so that was a Saturday night. <laughs> Six days later, I'm at Straight Blast Gym on a Friday night, and, and let me clarify. So while I'm still in the ring, still sweaty and bloody, I look at this coach, Matt Thornton from Straight Blast Gym, and I said, I just proved I will fight till I have nothing left. You cannot make me any tougher. You need to make me better. And he looks at me and he says, all right, I will. So six days later, we're in the gym Friday night, sparring, six days after this brutal war. And again, he's six foot eight. I have T-Rex arms at six foot tall. I have 72 I do and too. A half inch reach. I'm shorter than it's you, but ridiculous. I got the T-Rex arms. Like I got like a, like a fly weights arms band it is mm -hmm. annoying. It's ridiculous. And we have the uh, leaf blowers on the roof here. In case you're here and something. I don't but, worry about it. <laughs> but so I'm staying out at his range and I'm trying to work on slipping these jabs and crosses because that's, totally new to me and I don't know how to do that. And I clearly showed that in the last weekend. And he just starts teeing off on me, throwing bombs. And I should also mention that around this time I had picked up a copy of the Nevada State Athletic Commission book on boxing. And I was reading this and I was like, wait a minute. So these professional boxers, they spar maybe once a week. They work on their head movement, slipping and hitting focus mitts. That's completely the opposite of what I was told. I was told you get the basics down, then you just beat the crap out of each other. Why would you hit mitts since it's not realistic? And so reading this kind of opened my mind and then something else it said was basically, you're not trying to hurt each other in practice. You're saving that for the fights. So I went out and I bought 20 ounce sparring gloves, big pillows. Yes. I was the only one that bought 20 ounce sparring gloves. Thornton wore eights or tens bag gloves designed to protect his hands. So he's teeing off on me with these bag gloves. And I throw a big right hand, hit him with my pillow, 
throw them up against the wall and I go, I don't know what your problem is, but I'm an actual fighter. I'm fighting and I need to get better at that. I'm not trying to be a gym superstar and you're just trying to knock me out to make yourself feel better. And he looks at me and he says, well, the problem with you is you're no good and you never will be. So I'm just using you to make myself better. And I feel like I should have thanked him at the time because I finally knew who he was as a coach. And that was the last time we ever trained together. I then, I, I was in contact with Couture at that time. So I hit him up and yeah, he was at Performance Quest. And I said, hey, I'm, I'm just following you around now. I'm gonna be your training partner. And if things work out for me, awesome. But I'd rather be someplace where somebody at least appreciates my hard work. So it was, it was just a, a different time. It, it, everybody was trying to figure out their roles, figure out who were the good people, who were the villains and try to get along. Well, I think that's why I'm so drawn to early MMA is it's like the Wild West. It's like, it's almost yeah. like the modern Cowboys. I don't want to bury the lead though. So let me just talk about zombie cage fighter because like you're wearing the shirt and I believe it's based on your life, right? So tell me a little bit about this. It is. So everybody had been bugging me to write a biography, but I didn't want to write the usual Rocky story. It's been done a thousand times. You know, everybody knows guy comes out of nothing, knocks some people out, does well for himself. So I wanted to write, and I'm a huge comic book fan, a big nerd. Uh, with my unpleasant childhood, comic books were kind of my escape since I wasn't allowed to do sports. And that's still the case now with comic books. I, I just love the whole genre of them. I love the Marvel movies, all that stuff, Star Wars. I'm a big geek, to, to say it bluntly. So the story that I wanted to tell is about my life as a fighter and at the time as a single father, but then I threw in zombies. And I came out with the story of zombie cage fighter. And it really is what I've gone through, what I've seen and done as a fighter and as a father. And there's, there's direct things here, interactions that I've had that uh, I put right into the book. And like, uh, like one interaction that I'm sure probably every combatant has had where you're trying to negotiate a purse with the promoter. The promoter says the same thing every time man, I barely make a nickel on these shows. I can't afford you. I can't, I can't afford to pay you what you want as he jumps into his private jet and flies off or his, his Bentley. And I get to say the dream statement because I know that the promoter wants me. Oh, that's right, I forgot. There's never been a promoter in the world that's ever made a dime off of these fights. You all do it just because you love the sport so much. Hell, I should be paying you for the privilege of putting my life on the line. Good luck with the fights. Oh, hey, well, maybe I can find a little bit more money. And it's, man, I got to tell you, it's just, it's a dream come true to see this, this story come to fruition. And I've had just phenomenal artists to work with. The cover is an actual painting from an artist by the name of Alex Horley. Uh, and I, as I was writing this, I had to figure out, oh, how would you beat a zombie? You have to be worried about the bite. It's almost like if you're fighting somebody with a knife, they touch you with a knife, that's a game changer. With a zombie, if they bite you, then they win the fight no matter how it ends. And so I had to think, okay, keep the bite away from me. I can't knock him out. He's not gonna tap out. What can I do to win this fight? And I have a, a really nice sequence here from a, a mounted triangle with elbow slams and snapping the arm off. It's just been, my artist really came through. And all the promotion I'm doing for it right now is, uh, so the book itself is completed. The files are at the printer, but to do the big print run, that's where I need the support. So by going to zombiecagefighter.com, you'll see all these links right there that say Kickstarter. Click on the Kickstarter and just for 20 bucks, you can get a PDF of the book. I prefer if you pay 25 so you can get an actual hard copy and I'm signing every single copy, mailing it out to you. And of course, we have other reward tiers there as, as well. For every hardcore nerd, there's a name, Randy Bowen, and he does superhero sculptures. And he's a friend of mine and he did an actual sculpture of the zombie cage fighter for me. And it's a very limited, I only made a hundred of these. It's even got scars, damage from my back surgery from back in the day. And this is just a dream come true. And again, it's, it's on one of the reward tiers on the Kickstarter. 
And I think one of the best compliments I ever got about the story was <clears throat> way back when I first wrote it, I sent it off to my, my MMA agent at the time. And I didn't hear back from him for a couple months. And I was texting him and, hey, buddy, can you read my story? Let me know what you think. And finally, he calls me and he goes, man, I didn't want to call you because I didn't want to read the story because I knew it was going to suck. But dude, this is really good. What do you want to do with this? It's like, well, I want to do everything, a comic book and movies and all this stuff. So if I can win over my, my own bitter and jaded agent, and he believes that my story is good. And I have the same story too with Joe Silva, the matchmaker for the UFC, because he's a huge comic book nerd. <clears throat> I sent him the story and he said the same thing. I was going to read a couple pages just to shut you up. And he called me, I think, 2 a.m. his time on a Sunday night and just went, my God, this is so good. What do you want to do with this? So so I'm really happy. Uh, I was featured on, uh, Sally Cage Fighter was featured on Kevin Smith's show last night, uh, Fat Man Beyond. So I'm, I'm just happy. My whole goal has been to get the story out there and, and to share it with the world. Because as a kid, like I said, my escape from reality was comic books. And it's been a tough year for a lot of people. And even in these tight times, if, if this $25 purchase can help you escape for a little bit and get some enjoyment, man, that that's awesome. Well, you put a lot of time into it too. And I think that's something people got to remember is if you put a lot of time into it and people enjoy it, show a little money. Like if you make a video, I'm always a big fan of pay someone for their work, pay someone for their time. So I think it's important because you've put a lot of time in. And this was another question I had that goes into something else, but like, it always bothers me that fighters never get a pension or some form of benefits after, right? And it feels yeah. like what you're doing allows you to have a little bit more security and tell your story to people. Um, but that kind of bugs me that like, like guys like you, like there isn't just a distribution avenue or there isn't just things set in stone because you're, you put a lot of your life on the line for people to drink beer and just relax. Yeah. And every time an up and coming fighter asks me for advice, I always say the same thing. And they may be thinking, well, should I wrestle more? Should I box more? My advice is always treat it like a business. Because if you don't, at the end of your career, you will be left broken, broken. There's every promoter out there. They're doing it for a paycheck. No matter how much they love the sport, if they're not making money, they're not going to continue. Even the coaches, they may want to see you succeed. They still have bills to pay. They have to treat it like a business. If you're the one out there that doesn't see it that way, then at the end of it, you're going to have nothing. And this ride has to end at some point. To your, to what you just said, there, there is no old folks home for fighters where you get to go off and, and live at the farm and be taken care of. We're seeing great champions, uh, Coleman having to do a GoFundMe to get hip surgery. And he was one of the biggest stars way back in the day, pride champion, UFC champion. And these guys now are just struggling and the abuse that we've taken on our bodies. I've had 10 major surgeries, uh, 12, 13 screws in my face, six screws in my back, right pectoral reattached, left ankle operated on, uh, left bicep reattached, just all this damage, that, that wear and tear. And the protection that boxers have, that we as MMA fighters don't have, boxers have the Ali Act, which means that a promoter has to disclose how much money they're making. They can't, uh, they can't manage a boxer. They don't control the rankings. So if you win a lot of fights and you earn your title shot, you get your title shot. Whereas in the UFC, you can be, look at someone like John Fitch, who they didn't like. He was the number one contender for years and years and, and years. And never got the shot because they didn't like he his got style. One, he got one title shot against George St. Pierre, and then they shelved him and wouldn't give him anything else because he actually stood up for his rights and said, oh, you want me to sign over my likeness rights for nothing? Why would I do that? He just asked the question. And Dana White came down and said, cool, you're cut from the UFC and we're cutting all of AKA as well, unless you sign this. So they had to sign. But right now, well, we had a, so we started the All the Expansion Act. <clears throat> so it's essentially the exact same law but we're changing the verbiage from a boxer to a combatant. So MMA fighters will have that protection as well. And about five, four and a half years ago, we had 58 signers on our bill. 
the my numbers may be a little off, but they're roughly correct. I don't have my paperwork in front of me. The original Ali Act had 16 signers on the bill. Then it went to a, a House vote, passed, and it passed, signed into law. Ali, Ali Act, now a law. Us, with these 58 signers, bipartisan, the original Ali Act had more Democrats and Republicans. Our, our Ali Expansion Act had more Republicans than Democrats. We were in committee. We were told it was going to go to vote within the next couple of weeks. And then we had a change of occupancy in the White House. And that occupant is very good friends and very well funded by Dana White. And the Ali Expansion Act would completely change his business. He wouldn't go out of business, but now he'd have to start bidding for fights and paying fighters what they're worth on the free market. And so after a meeting with Mr. Trump, our bill never left committee and it's been dead ever since. So our goal then next year is to once again, start hitting up the, the floor of the congressional halls and getting signers again, because this, this bill becoming law will change, change the world for MMA fighters. And then we've, we've got our class action lawsuit as well, where we, we claim that the UFC has monopolized the sport, monopsonized the sport for so many years and artificially suppressed the wages of the fighters. If you look at uh, the world's best boxers compared to the world's best MMA fighters, they get around 10%. Uh, like a, a good boxing card, 85% of the money will go to the boxers. A good UFC card, 17, 18% will go to the entire card. So every sport has had to go through this. In fact, every industry has had to go through this. There's something called the Triangle Shirtwaist Fire that took place 100 years ago or so where there were no fire exits, everything was dangerous, the, the doors were locked and well over, I believe it was over a hundred people died in that fire because the owners, they had no responsibility to provide safe working conditions. So everyone there, they went on strike and they fought for rights. And now we have fire exits. Now we have all these safety measures. Same thing happened in baseball, same thing happened in football. And the owners, the promoters, again, they always say the same thing. God, you guys are so greedy. We're giving you a chance to live your dream and you want to get paid for it too? That's ridiculous. I barely make a nickel on these shows. Oh no, you make a lot. It's time for us because we're the product. We're not somebody just putting nuts and screws together. We're the actual product that you're selling. Nobody's going to buy an empty cage pay-per-view. So it's just our turn. It's our time to make sure that we get what we're, we're due. If you could have fought any boxer, like Conor McGregor fought Floyd, who would it have been in your day? Oh, man. Is there anybody with one arm? Jeez. <laughs> the, 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 the best thing about my game was being able to take guys out of their game. So I have, you're never going to see me standing up to a boxer going, hey, man, let's throw down. No, man, that's your specialty. That's your specialty. It was like, a, like when Couture fought James Tony. And I, I wasn't training with Randy at the time, uh, but I was doing an interview and somebody said, so how often uh, do you think Randy's going to stand and trade blows? I went, are you kidding me? With one of the best boxers that ever lived? No, Randy's going to shoot a low ankle pick. He's going to put him on his ass and never let him back up. And Randy shot a low ankle pick, put him on his ass, and I believe choked him out. And then James Tony came out and said, well, hey, man, step into my world. I was willing to step in yours. And Randy went, no, I'm not going to do, I'll just freely tell you, you're way better than me at boxing, but this is the, this is fighting in general. Yeah. That's where I can succeed. I'm never good enough to be the best at jujitsu, the best kickboxer, the best boxer. I'm just good enough to hopefully take guys out of their world. You want to box with me? I'm going to clinch with you. You want to clinch with me? I'm going to take you down. You want to wrestle with me? I'm going to box with you. You're very humble with what you know. Like, the, I don't think a lot of people would ever say that. Like, a lot of people would uh, be more grandiose. How did you turn pro? Like, what was the moment of turning pro? And what was your first fight like? Boy, that's kind of a tough question because, like, when I look at my career, it's almost like every fight was a pro fight. I just wasn't getting paid for it. I think in reality, the only real amateur fight was the first one that I had that was Pancrase, which was open hand. So we're slapping each other. But you can deliver some damage with the yeah, heel, yeah. With, with 
the strikes, it's solid. Uh, when I started getting paid for it, it was just, just kind of the same old things. When I fought Mike Whitehead, that was an amateur fight. Uh, I fought uh, Drew McFedrin's. I don't recall if that was my first pro fight or not, but the rules itself were a mixture of pride and UFC. So Drew McFedrin's was managed by Monty Cox. Monty Cox is one of the great MMA managers of all time. He's from like he has, Iowa, right? Like, I think so. Yeah. Because he managed Rich Franklin, Tim Sylvia, Jens Pulver, and all the, he has a list of champions and he will tell you, it's not by accident. I, I breed champions. And he would do that by having his own show. So he invites me out to go fight on his show against his undefeated prospect, Drew McFedries. So I'm fighting Monty Cox's fighter. Monty so you're Cox's the opponent. Show. You're the opponent. With Monty Cox's referee. And I didn't know anything about Drew McFedry. So all I knew was that I'm just going to go out there and I'm going to fight uh, as hard as I can. And we're going to see what's going to happen. And I just stayed in his face the entire time. And I kept body locking him and taking him down. And the combination of the UFC and Pride Bulls, as I said, was in UFC, you could elbow, but you couldn't knee an opponent on the ground. In Pride, you could knee an opponent on the ground and soccer kick him, but you couldn't elbow. Well, in this show, you could do both. So you could land elbows, and when you hit the ground, you could throw knees to the head as well. And so I'm just constantly moving forward and grabbing him and getting him down. And at one point he turtles, and my ankles are underneath the ropes. No danger of us whatsoever of going outside the ring. The referee stands us up, puts us back to the center of the ring, which was Drew's best, best uh, chance for winning. Because it's been said from that camp, Drew McFedrys hits harder than anyone else there. Like him, yeah, just, just brutal. And so, and that actually gives me one of my favorite highlights of all my fights because we were, it was just a catch weight. We just weighed in whatever we were. We were like 202, 204. Whatever weight. Yeah, both shaved heads. He's really dark skin. I'm ghostly white. Uh, he was a southpaw. I'm orthodox. And he hits me with this straight left. And my head just whips back. And I smash him with a right hand in return. And I just keep beating on and beating on until he's falling out of the ring. And I'm trying to pull him back into the ring. And I'm thinking that and the referee jumps in and, and pulls me off. And I'm thinking, well, he's going to restart us. And I'm thinking to myself, well, of course he is, bullshit, because I was winning. And I look over my corner, and there's Randy and Robert Fallis jumping up and down. I'm like, what are you idiots so happy about? They're like, it's over. You won. And so I, I'd beaten Drew. But that time when the referee stood us up, Coach Orr had given me some, some really good advice from being a, an athlete his entire life. He said, there's going to be times when you get bad calls, when the referee does something that you don't like. Instead of uh, bitching and whining about it, use it as an opportunity to show how much better you are than your opponent and punish them for the bad call. So when I got stood up, I just went, cool. I was beating you on the ground. I'll beat you standing too. And that's how it ended with me just standing there beating on him as he was falling out of the ring. And since that time, I, I like Drew. I've, I've seen him at shows. He had a lot of health issues, but then he came through those and made it into the UFC and had a, a great career in it. And we were talking about that fight one time and he goes, man, all I wanted was five seconds to catch my breath and you just would not stop coming. It's like, yeah, man, <laughs> if you know how hard you hit, I'm not gonna stand out at range and slowly move in on you. Well, Nate, this is everything I'd expected and more than that. And where can people follow you? And one more time, just kind of state your, uh, like your comic, the zombie cage fighter, like in all the info. Yeah, zombiecagefighter.com. You can go there and you'll see the Kickstarter link. You go there and the whole goal was to fund the printing. We've reached our funding goal, but more than anything, my goal was to be able to share my story, to get it out there in the world. So every purchase of that will go towards printing more copies, will incentivize me to do the sequel, uh, which I'm already working on. This one's all about me. The sequel is going to be all about my daughter. Uh, and you can follow me on Twitter, Nate Rock Quarry. I'm going to warn you, though, I'm very opinionated, 
If you want to have a conversation about me with any of the stuff I post, I'm always there for it. I, I don't generally block people unless they're abusive. People have different opinions in mind, and I'm, I'm all for it. I'm fine, but uh, just be warned. And then Instagram, I think, is Zombie Cage Fighter or, or Nathan Poirier. I'm around. I'm pretty easy to find.